So Silas, um, I would say um, we had a really great visit to the farm. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I would say it's unlike any other farm that I've been on. Every other farm I've visited, the first thing they do is show you the buildings. And after they've shown you the buildings, they show you the, the tractors and all the kit. And then finally, if you're lucky, you get a glimpse at the fields and the livestock. But when I visited, Silas took me straight onto the fields, straight up to the herd. And we had a great time walking through and with the herd. And I think that probably for me was a sort of like it really got open my eyes and I hope that through this talk we'll be able to give you a feel of that uh, that 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 um, that meeting that we had um, what I suggest is to start Silas could you tell us a bit about how you actually got into this and what brought you into this sort of regenerative more natural form of agriculture Ah, you're muted, Silas. Sorry, I'll try and keep it brief. I guess it's not, you know, too interesting. But my, I, my farming connection comes from my my family, all in New Zealand, and uh, we've got quite conventional dairy farms and kiwi fruit orchards. When I say conventional, the kind of, you know, the the normal way of farming. Um, but the key difference with New Zealand farming in general compared to say British is, is it's very much more grass based you know I grew up with working on a farm and always seeing the cattle outside uh, all, all throughout the year um, and relatively you know lower cost of production and you know and New Zealand has that reputation for kind of being at the top of the curve in kind of agricultural kind of ingenuity and, and everything else so I guess as I got older into my later teens, I started working a little bit on British farms. Um, you know, I went back to New Zealand. I grew up here, by the way, I went to school here, but um, I spent most of my, my school holidays flying back to New Zealand, being on the family farms. So that was always the way that I thought farming was normal. It was actually quite different here in the UK, especially when you kind of get to October to April and you do see most livestock that are indoors in barns being fed in relatively intensive systems. I couldn't really quite figure out why that had to be the norm and it never really quite sat right with me. And, you know, I've worked on intensive dairy farms in the UK. I've worked on conventional arable farms. I've kind of, I've, I've dipped my toe into kind of everything really. Um, but I guess it was just kind of subconscious feeling that it didn't quite sit right. And there was some, something that didn't feel that this should be the way that we should be making food and growing food. And I understand that lots of farmers farm the way they do for various reasons. They're locked in with contracts and, you know, there's very difficult margins to meet. So it's very much about kind of high input, high output and how you make that margin work. But I guess for me, I just kind of wanted to do something a bit different. And I was very interested in, 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 in grazing cattle and being, cattle being out on grass. Um, you know, I didn't really commit to farming so I was about 21, 22, I'm 29 now. So I shifted into the Royal Agriculture University where I did a one year postgraduate course. Um, I'd already done an undergrad um, in, in business, but, and from then I went and got a, my first management job as a farm manager on the Isle of Wight, managing about a thousand acres of chalk grassland with Highland cattle. And I did that in a way that, you know, I'd, fairly free license to farm in the way that I thought was right um, which was great being your first manager's job um, you know that was predominantly based on an outwintering system so the majority of the cattle being outside all year round and relatively low input I kind of got a bit of a bug I watched lots of things like River Cottage I wanted to dabble with direct selling and kind of building a, a food and a brand business but um, the, my previous employer wasn't too keen on the idea so I saw this job come up at English Farm which you know they just set up this this new farm with longhorn cattle and they were you know talking about all the things that interested me about being on grass and grazing outside all year round I'm linking that in with this new farm butchery project that hadn't yet launched um, so you know luckily I, I got offered that job um, you know three or four months after I started we opened the butchery and that's when I kind of really got into the world of organics. Um, English Farm is a certified organic and certified pasture-fed livestock association or PFLA 
farm, which basically means that all the livestock on the farm were certified to be 100% pasture fed. So zero concentrate, zero grains, zero anything. Basically, it doesn't grow in your pasture or you can't cut and preserve from your pastures like hay. Um, and, you know, I guess three, four years ago when I arrived, it was, I was very much the tip of the iceberg. And once I, you know, I realized I had to kind of really commit to this way of farming and, and learn more about it. And that's when I kind of really found this deep rabbit hole of regenerative agriculture and holistically planned grazing. And, you know, basically, instead of thinking about producing as much beef as possible from your resource, which is land, thinking of it in a different way and actually thinking more about what you're doing for the soil. And then if you focus on soil, everything falls into place, soil, pasture, cattle, biodiversity, environment. And it's more of a case that, you know, the, the cattle on English farm are more of a, a tool or, you know, some people actually use the analogy of a paintbrush on the canvas. You're trying to create this picture or this outcome which is your farm regenerating and improving year on year on and becoming more diverse and sequestering carbon and and you know being a you know a, a kind of Eden for wildlife and, and you kind of use your cattle to to create those outcomes. And you know, you, you might say I've got a fairly large bookshelf and um, you know, a lot of that is literature and books of you know, relating to regenerative agriculture, people that might have been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years, and, you know, they've kind of given their accounts and they're starting to get more research on it. But it's really one of those things that it, once farmers hear about it and they start to understand it, they really get bitten by this bug. And if they've got the kind of guts to shift out from what them and usually their father and grandfather have been doing for the last hundred years and go down this route, you know, it's a real snowball effect and, you, and, you, and they kind of get so excited about the potential of, of what regenerative agriculture means for food production environment, you know, climate change, sequestering carbon. And um, yeah, as I say, it's a very deep rabbit hole once you start setting off and run into it. Wow. And it's something that you, uh, I'm just thinking back to walking through the meadow and something you talked about was the value of the weeds. You know, the value of those plants, which most farmers would probably try and eradicate uh, that were growing there. And it came up in the talk with Mary Berry, I think, as well, that you did. The, 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 the one in particular, which is a purgative, which actually helps the cows to, to rid themselves of intestinal worms. Now, now, yeah, could, you talk, could you talk a bit about the grass itself and, and, sure. and perhaps how you, how you develop the grass as well? Well... I think the key is, is farmers associate this word weed with something bad, something undesirable, something unproductive, something that's creating a problem. Um, and actually, if you look into what these plants do, they're very much the opposite of that. So a weed is a problem when you get a single species start dominating a pasture. You know, if you see a field and it's 90% thistles or docks, it's because it's, there's a problem. Essentially weeds, or undesirable plants are usually a symptom of, of poor land soil management. So, for example, thistles is usually overgrazing, docks is usually deep compaction, and, and, and Mother Nature puts these things in there to solve those problems. So docks have very deep tap roots. They're put there to try and break up that compaction. So when you start thinking about these plants differently, um, you get a very different appreciation for what they all do. And it, the, the key is, is this diversity. Actually, the, the more plant species you have in a pasture, the healthier it is, the more biology is circulating through that soil, through that pasture, the more nutrients, the more minerals are going into those cattle. So if you look at say an intensive dairy farming system, you know, they've probably got some agribusiness salesman consultant telling them every year to buy a certain type of rye grass, which is very vigorous growing type of grass it's not very well balanced in terms of, of, of minerals nutrients it's quite high in protein but it just grows like mad but it doesn't do well in drought and 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 in cold um, environments and they'll put you know maybe one or two types of white clover in there and you've got a two-dimensional pasture then you've kind of just got your you know lettuce and asparagus and then you know to make yourself healthy you're pumping yourself full of, of mineral supplements and that's the kind of I guess it's an analogy for how more intensive systems work. They're very fast growing grasses, but they're not very wholesome. They're not doing a lot for soil biology. 
because there's only two types of plant. There's only two ways those plants are interacting with soil, where if you look at the much more diverse pastures, you have plants that, you know, some are very mineral dense, some are helping that compaction with the soil, some higher in protein, some do better in drought, some do better in colder climates, some will come through long for earlier in the spring, some will come through later in the autumn. So the more diversity you can go into that, you know, the, 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 the thicker your, you know, your blanket is to, to, to kind of iron out those problems where your cattle end up being mineral deficient or they're not gaining weight without having to supplement them with grains and concentrates. So if you look at English farm, it's very much a case of, you know, and, and the way that we influence that, if you think mother nature doesn't work in monocultures, you look at any natural environment, there's no single species of plant dominating that environment, um, unless it's being influenced by, by man management in some way. So we just try and think how nature works, treat our farm as an ecosystem. And the way we do that is we look how to hurt herds of herbivores work in the natural environment so if you think about wildebeest and savannas of africa or bison in the prairies of america before they kind of all got um you know faced out by european settlement and fencing and growing corn and maize this is large animals large her, large heavy herbivores moving as a single unit through a landscape usually eating about half of the plant trampling the other half and the, the herd impact, so the actual physical impact of their hooves is breaking up the soil, it's stimulating that seed bank, it's kind of bringing light to the soil and it's, it's giving soil connection to physical connection with the seeds. And they move through an area, usually because of predators and urinating and dung, they don't want to stay in the same place for too long. And they don't come back to that area for quite a long time, usually months, even years sometimes in, in those um, more wild environments. And what you see is this amazing diversity of plant life that where it has this full recovery period and it has these short, intense grazing periods um, and these like really dense um, fertilization from the urinating and dung of closely packed animals and lots of this trampling effect. So a lot of that plant matter is trampled into the soil, which builds organic matter, i.e. your carbon. Those plants break down, become more soil. And um, we're just trying to emulate that with our own cattle instead of kind of wolves and lions running around moving stock, it's me and some electric fencing. And, you know, it's that using that herd impact and those long recovery periods and those short grazing intervals to build long rotations into our pastures, which give them the opportunity to fully express themselves and for the biodiversity to improve over time because you're letting plants kind of go through that full cycle, breaking the soil structures up with hooves. Whereas more intensive systems, you know, they'll be going back and overgrazing plants and staying in the same place for too long or coming back too quickly, which really knocks the energy and the root reserves out of the most desirable plants that are being grazed and the least desirable ones aren't getting grazed and they overtake and dominate and then become weeds because you then get thistle infested fields because they're the things that haven't been grazed. So yeah. that's a very long winded answer to your question. No, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good answer. Thank you. They Something that uh, I was surprised by as we walked, I mean, we're talking about now we're still in winter and yet the, 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 the grass itself was looking really healthy and that was the grass that they were grazing. And something else that you mentioned to me at the time was that you do actually have an input, which is that you do take cut hay, but you take it from very specific places. Perhaps you could tell us a bit about that and the value of it as well. Sure. And I'll, link, I'll try and link that in with a bit of kind of costings and economics as well. So you can kind of get that perspective so pretty much the only thing that we really spend much money on at English Farm is is this amazingly species rich diverse meadow hay which we get from two two auto organic and pasture for life certified farms um, one is just down near Pangbourne on the Hardwick estate and the other is just um, south of Oxford along both along the River Thames obviously and um, what we do with that is we're for one, importing that carbon onto our farm. So, you know, we're not, you know, we're not detracting our own, we're not taking away from our own carbon reserves and outsourcing that to someone else with importing that. And what we're doing is we're looking at these amazing 
very rare actually now wild flower meadows that they have i think at the one in oxford they had 120 different species of plant herb and legume and wildflower on their last count and they're very closely linked with oxford university so they do lots of studies with them and essentially what we're doing is all the seed that is comes in in those bales of hay is being deposited onto our soils through the winter so you might see when you're driving around, if you do see cattle outside, you often see a, a, a metal ring feeder. So you've got a bale of hay surrounded by a metal ring and you've got cattle all around it and it's a hell of a mess and they're kind of up to their belly in mud. Now that's, that's very damaging for soil. It's not great for cattle welfare. So what we do is we roll or I fork out, um, so we have square bells, so I can't roll them. So I drive along and in a, in a long line, I kind of fork the hay out. So the cattle each get their own little bit of hay to eat. There's no kind of competition to get around this ring feeder. They eat most of it. What they don't eat, they trample into our soil. So that's coming back to that trampling effect, that herd effect of, of the cattle physically pushing organic matter or carbon or you know that, that actual leaf litter into the soil, which is building our own carbon and, and essentially building soil over time. And along with that also goes the seed of all of these plants. Um, and you know a lot of the seed also that they ingest comes out the other end in a cow pat and boof you've got a big nitrogen and, and phosphate bomb along with that seed as well so in the spring what you see is every year our own pastures are improving so you know we're seeing species of plant and flower and herb and legume that you know weren't here last year or they weren't here in such density and we're doing that essentially for free other than the cost of buying the hay. So we buy the hay, the hay feeds the cows, the cows make milk to feed the calves, they, they make meat to make themselves bigger which eventually goes into our butchery. Um, at the same time they're reseeding our pastures, they're putting organic matter or carbon into our soil, they're building soil and they're doing that every day you know from kind of the end of November until the middle of April. Um, whereas other farmers, for instance, they'll get to April and they'll be getting the tractors out and they'll be loading up their muck trailer with all the muck that's in the barns. They'll be putting it in the, in the back of the trailer. They'll be driving all over the farm, you know, compacting their soils, making a mess to spread all the muck around. Um, they'll be buying seed from the seed merchant. Again, that'll go into the back of a tractor and they'll be driving up and down their fields to, to put this seed into their pastures. And it might not work. It might work. Um, so that just kind of just gives the comparison that, you know, other farmers might be trying to achieve the same thing, but doing it by spending lots of money and lots of time in tractors and burning lots of diesel, where this whole kind of idea of regenerative agriculture, we're, we're doing it with a very low, almost footprint, you know, my buggy's a let. Uh, I think we're losing you, Silas. I don't know. Can you hear us? No, you're frozen, Silas. Uh, I think until Silas comes back, um, I'll just relate a little bit of what I found when I actually visited the, the farm. Um, and I think that uh, something that I want to dis discuss with Silas, if he, can, if he gets back to us, is the, the actual social organisation of the of the herd, um, something that really surprised me as we walked through the herd was Silas was talking about the various groups of cows and about their social organization. I'd never really thought about this before. I've seen herds of cows driven to a milking parlor. I've seen herds of cows on the land, you know, uh, in a more conventional agriculture. But this really was a, a, a first for me. Uh, and in fact, he pointed over and he said, look, that's grandma. And he's got, she's got two of her daughters and two granddaughters with, let me just admit silence. I silence you back. Oh, Christ. Yeah. So I'm stealing your thunder. I'm stealing your thunder. I started talking a little bit about the um, 
about your the, the so social organization of the herd and the story you know you, you pointed out to me grandma with the two daughters and granddaughters and about how they organized and perhaps you could sort of yeah, develop that a little bit and talk a bit about that sure um well i guess the key point of what we're doing is to build that recovery period so essentially we want as we want a very short amount of time and a small amount of pasture and the best way to achieve that is by having a single herd instead of multiple herds that are kind of most farmers adopt to make management easier so they'll kind of have cows with calves in one group last year's female calves in another, last year's male calves in another, and vice versa. They end up kind of having six, seven, eight herds across the farm, which means you're kind of running eight mini farms, which means you've got eight bits of pressure. So by having a single herd, you obviously get this, this kind of natural mosaic of, you know, our oldest cow who's 17, right the way down to the calves that were born last July. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll have calves that are we'll, due to be born this May. So you know, you've got multi-generations of cattle all in the same group. It's very minimal stress. They they definitely know they're related. You'll see kind of, you know, six, seven, eight related cattle that look almost identical, hanging out in the same corner, a bit like you do see families down the park. Um, and, you know, in general with cattle, you do get these, these social hierarchy systems. You've always got the kind of the, the matriarch um you know i like to say that i'm the boss cow and they kind of know that and they follow me but under me you've kind of got the the female boss and then um and you've also got the kind of the loner that's a bit pushed out of the group and you've kind of got the you know the big happy nanny cow where all the calves tend to hang around her and she's kind of watching over everybody so you know and it's that's that whole holistic view it's looking at everything in the whole wider spectrum of what are you doing what are the decisions you're making having on a you know a cattle welfare point of view environment soil production um you know biodiversity you know even social and 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 kind of community value as well as that whole perspective okay something that you touched on earlier on you said that you started off with a business qualification and that you're you really what the reason one of the reasons you went for this job was because it was really from the field to the shop. Um, I mean, perhaps you could describe a bit about how that works, and and it would be interesting just to bring make people aware of the farmers market and what that means to you. Uh, I'll ask a couple of questions about that later on, but perhaps you could talk a bit about that. Sure. So. Well, you know, we're still a relatively new business. Um, I've been here three years. The cows have been here a year older than, longer than me, and the butchery opened. That's four or five months after I started. So we've been growing quite organically. We haven't kind of, you know, we haven't put lots of money into advertising. But, you know, we've just taken on a full-time butchery manager, which is great. So we have Sam here now who's here five days a week. So he can take an order over the phone or by email. He'll cut it fresh, and you can come and collect it from the farm. Um, at a range time. We've done Marlow Market and Henley Farmers Market pretty much since we started. Marlow is the first Saturday of the month and Henley Market is the second Saturday. You'll find us there pretty much every month. Um, and that's just a really great way for everybody to support local producers in our area. And, you know, it's definitely not just English farm. We're, we're, I, I imagine we're one of the luckiest places in the country in terms of you know, local producers and, and amazing produce. So, you know, that they are kind of three selling points. And before COVID, we we did quite a few farm events and, you know, ways to get people out to the farm to see what we're doing, to talk about it, get excited about it. Various different formats. Some of them were kind of a whole day event with farm walks and then a barbecue. And, you know, we've got a blacksmith on the farm, so demonstrations and from the and from the beekeepers. Other than more kind of formal events, you buy a ticket for a sit down dinner, multi course dinner in one of our barns. Um, we did a great picnic event last September with kind of live music from Rebecca Poole, who's Purdy, and we had the, the, the horse box trailer from the cherry tree. And, you know, we, we try and get people excited about what we're doing. Um, and, you know, there is a business slant to that, but it's more of a sense that I think. Food production in general, 
really needs to shift so that what we're doing isn't the norm it isn't the unique it's more of the norm and um you know if we can kind of make people more aware of that whether that's by doing webinars like this or inviting people out to the farm for a farm walk and and some food then then that's great and um you know hopefully when covid kind of phases out we'd be back to that and we'll do some quite exciting things here but um you know, we're actually planning for Easter weekend, um, Thursday the 1st afternoon, 12 till 4, and also Friday the 2nd. We're just going to do a, a pop-up farm shop. So you don't have to make an order beforehand. You can just turn up. Um, Sam will be here. You can make an order. He can make you some steaks or burgers, whatever, for the weekend, some lamb as well. Um, and we'll have a little barbecue going so you can have a burger to take away. So... We're starting to get the ball rolling on that. And, you know, if anyone on this webinar wants to come along, I'll be there. So I'll happily talk to them about kind of what we do. And I'm sure the cows won't be too far away either. That'd be brilliant. That's really great. Good. Going on beyond that, are there things that are getting in your way at the moment? Are there things that you're finding are make, frustrating you that you can you would like to see improved, you know, whether it's the government attitude or whether it's... Uh, you know, other farmers, you know, what, what, what are the, it's a bit of a negative point, but is other things that you see that could, could be improved? I think with agriculture and actually most issues, this is going all the way up to kind of climate change and everything. These are very complex issues with lots of, you know, active things that are having influences on that and lots of different stakeholders that have, you know, different priorities. So it's quite a, complicated thing to answer but human nature wants a simple answer to everything um i guess from a government level a lot of what they're pushing in terms of you know we've obviously left europe and what we used to be in was this thing called the common agricultural policy which was a kind of a european blanket of everyone puts money into a pot and it gets redistributed around agriculture accordingly and a lot of that linked in with you know subsidies to you know to plant trees on your farm or, or whatever um and it looks like what the uk government are trying to do yet they're not really giving a hell of a lot of detail is is support farmers or encourage farmers financially to do things that look at sequestering carbon improving the water cycle you know and enhancing biodiversity so some farmers will generally not do a hell of a lot unless there's a financial incentive um so hopefully that's going to push more of those people into it what I am actually seeing, I don't know if it's just because I'm surrounded by these people because of, you know, they're the people I gravitate to, but more and more people are going down this route, whether they're arable farmers, organic farmers, livestock, whatever, they, 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 they're hearing about this regenerative agriculture kind of groundswell, if you like. And more and more people are wanting to do it. More and more people are getting excited about it. And, you know, there's, there's so many different aspects to it. Um, you know, for example, there's a, there's a piece of research called the Drawdown Research that was done by an American research scientist called, I think his name is Paul Hawkins. But he basically looked at every single um, potential solution to the climate crisis. You know, he has, he has no link to agriculture whatsoever. He's a very kind of impartial, neutral person. Um, you know, this covered everything from solar panels, green energy, planting trees everything and of the top 20 of the 100 solutions i think something like eight or nine of them came under the, the broader umbrella of regenerative agriculture so this is things like what we do like planned grazing holistically planned grazing about you know sequestering carbon growing more grass building soil up to things like agroforestry and silvo pasture planting trees as part of your farming system you know, permaculture, which is this idea where it's kind of more this Garden of Eden approach. We have a kind of a, you know, like a, a forest garden where there's a huge diversity of, of fruit trees and nuts and plants that you can pick. So all of these things, basically, and once you added them all together and you put them under a single banner of regenerative agriculture, they were the number one solution to fighting climate change by almost double that of number two, um, which is seriously punchy stuff so i think it's you know it's definitely snowball that's growing and it's gonna suck more and more industries into this uh, i just hope that i think the danger is is when i think one of the problems why it's not getting more traction it's quite hard to monetize 
So, you know, I'm getting a bit political now, but, you know, it's very easy for, say, big corporation and industry to make money off something, say, veganism, because it involves, you know, lab grown meat and uh, quite a manufactured supply chain, which they can invest in and influence. But generally, regenerative agriculture comes down to the farmer and it's the farmer that's kind of doing these things. And it's the farmer that's going to benefit as well as society and mankind and everything else. So I just hope that, you know, what's happening in regenerative agriculture doesn't kind of get hijacked by the wrong people with a hell of a lot of money and political clout. And I think that's the biggest threat, but I think there's a very genuine, you know, momentum to what's going on, to be honest, at the moment, which is great. Yeah, I guess there's the whole chem agrochemical industry, which looks as though it could see itself going out of business potentially if the majority of farmers turned over to these more natural methods. Great. The, you, you touched on a bit on the business. You said the shop, uh, you'd like people to order beforehand uh, by, uh, so they can, I think all the details for that are on the website. And as you said, you're also on Instagram, which is how we got in touch with you initially. I think Lily got in touch with you on Instagram in the first instance. So um, do you use Facebook? Um, I, I, I have, we have a Facebook account that's linked to the Instagram. Um, so generally what I put on Instagram pops up on Facebook. Okay. Yeah. Um, that, you know, essentially until a week or so ago, English farm, you know, the, Robert's the owner, um, you know, and he's quite a busy person. So, you know, English farm was predominantly me doing both the farm and the butchery sales and all the marketing aspect. And we had like a part-time butcher who'd come in and pack and cut. Um, but we're we're building a team now, which is great. So as I said, that we have a full time butcher involved. Um, so yeah, we're trying to make it more accessible, easy, you know, more convenient, I guess. Um, so at the moment, it is predominantly order collect by appointment. But you know, I think Sam's looking to do some kind of a pop up shop idea on a Saturday, and maybe we can, you know, think of some kind of local delivery round every week or two for people that aren't able to travel um so yeah we're we're getting there but we're um we're pretty right. small business but right that's really good um i think sort of i've sort of run out of questions i think should we turn it over to the floor sure so uh if i bring up the chat uh um the first question I got up here, hold on, let's, let's start at the top. Um, at the start, did you, this is, this is from uh, David, at the start, did you measure anything to start the program, i.e. elements of soil quality? Have you set targets? In other words, have you done, is it very much by touch and feel, or is it, you know, have you done any science behind it? Yeah, there's a bit of both. So, you know, we do have maybe 10 years um, records of soil tests and soil sampling, you know, fairly generic ones, to be honest. Um, I'm looking at, you know, now I obviously have a lot more time because I'm not juggling both the butchery aspect and the farming aspect. That's very much what I'm now focusing on is the farm and much more data and and, and recording. But you know, yeah, I, I want to kind of break away from those mainstream soil samples and look very much more at the kind of the, the deeper micro level things of what's going on, the organic matter, the more micronutrients that don't get tend to get measured so much. But unless you know what's going on with those, you're not sure how they're reacting with the other things that cause problems or solve things. So soil is such a complicated thing to understand they say that people know more about the deepest points of the ocean and the furthest parts of space than we know about soil right now so um you know if you know any budding young scientists out there i'd urge them to go into soil science because it's um it's a pretty unknown thing but yeah we do have records there's these the, the network that we're in within regenerative agriculture in the uk the part of fed livestock association it's it's full of those people that are the, the front of that field so you know, there's an app that's been developed, for example, called Soil Mentor, Mentor, which allows you to map your the allows you to map your farm and take your own soil samples, measuring things like, um, you know, the rate at which water infiltrates, um, you know, to your soil samples, how much runoff you're getting from that 
from that water, you know, whether it's diversity, a worm count, all these kinds of things. So that's that's something that we're actually we're part of the beta kind of development stage of that app. But it's yeah, it's definitely something that I'm looking to you know yeah. improve on and do more of now that I have a bit more time. So that sounds that's a, that sounds really good. Uh, so there's another one here, which is how do you, which it kind of follows on from that, which is how do you monitor biodiversity on the farm? We talked a bit about the types of plants that are grown. Do you do a count of, of, of plants? Do yeah, you, again, that's something, you know, there's lots of groups out there that are quite keen to come and count birds, count insects, count plants, um, you know, wildfire. So, you know, and that's, again, it's something that that's top of the list that we need to start doing more of. I guess for me, a relatively shorter sense of time, I go out and I'm out on that farm every single day. And, you know, there's rarely days that I don't see mammals from the top of the food chain to the bottom. I see dung beetles in our cow packs, which you won't see in intensive systems because they've all been killed off by the ivermectin that they get in the cattle wormers. So the cow packs stay in the field forever until they kind of dry up and wash away by the rain. Um, all the way up to, you know, the, you know, the, the, the predators like foxes, buzzards and red kites. And when you're seeing that whole from the smallest organisms in your soil up to those kind of more apex predators and you're seeing a, a, a thriving population of all of those on a daily basis then you, you know that you're doing something right in terms of the you know the the, yeah. the fauna biodiversity and, and with the flora um i think something that kind of sticks in my memory is so robert's been here 20 odd years and after doing the bale grazing in the winter for a number of years, he's made comments to me most every spring I've been here about, you know, he hasn't seen X and Y, you know, certain plant or whatever in, in these fields, or, you know, there's, there's been a big flush of something like burst tree treefall or, or plantain that he hadn't seen here in anywhere near the same densities. And, you know, I've seen plants in our, in our soils like sandfoin, which there's no way that that's probably in our seed bank or if it is, um, you know, it's, it hasn't been around for a long time. So it's very much anecdotal, observational. Um, so yeah, how we put that in into more empirical data is kind of top of the list, really. Yeah, maybe you need to serve uh, a team of young researchers to get Reading University onto it. Uh, well, if there's anyone around that wants to come and um, give me a hand, and they're more than welcome. Okay, great. So there's a shout out to the group. Um, so Julia is asking, do you do workshops and talks for local farmers? Have you tried to evangelise and spread the word? Um, we do. We, I, haven't, I haven't set something up and advertised something as a, an official event, but I do get lots of farmers contact me um, asking if they can come and see what we're doing. And, you know, I get lots of people. We, I have bloggers people in the fitness industry that want to know more about what we're doing on the farming level that makes the meat more nutrient dense and it makes the whole fitness world storm go mad. Um, as I said, yeah, farmers, um, just general consumers, lots of people that you'd be surprised that they're interested in what we're doing often come to me and ask if they can kind of come and have a walk around and ask questions and see what we're doing. So, but yeah, I think, again, that's something now that we're kind of going to phase two of English farm, if you like, then we have a bit more of a, a team involved that will, um, and, you know, getting through COVID as well, well, we'll be looking at doing more of those kind of educational events as well as the ones that revolve a bit more around food as well. So there's a, there's a one which is, I guess, a very important one, but which probably a lot of people skirt around here, is where are the animals slaughtered? Because I'm sure you don't do that on the farm. No, there, there is a project going on at the moment, um, which is looking at a mobile abattoir. There's obviously lots of kind of hurdles and red tape with that, but um, we're hoping that, you know, that's another kind of farm very closely linked to us in terms of, you know, what they're doing, who they are and certification. So, you know, that's something that's potentially around the corner. Um, and, but, you know, no, the, I take the animals myself on a trailer and they go to a local family abattoir in Farnborough. Um, I unload them and they come back to the butchery the next day. So, you know, it's, it's definitely not the best part of my job, but it's an essential part of it. And, you know, I always take the animals in pairs and it's always me there at the start and at the end. So, you know, as far as I can, I make that as kind of 
stress-free and and easy as possible really yeah right so so what is there's a question here uh uh from lily what is the biggest challenge that prevents other farms from moving into re the re regenerative model uh is it a lot more expensive uh what needs to be done to encourage more farms to go this way i think there's lots of answers to that question so if you think about soil that's had lots of artificial inputs put on it so i guess a, a broad view of what's happened prior to the second world war there was lots more wildflower meadows there was lots more everything was organic pretty much there was lots more livestock there was this this what kind of what we're doing at english farm was the normal way of rearing livestock world war comes along they need lots of grain to make rations they rip out the hedgerows plant big fields of grain um and after the war that didn't really go back and what they had was lots of ammunition factories with lots of phosphates and things in it that made bombs and and, and bullets and it was very easy to turn that infrastructure and those resources into making you know chemical fertilizers and pesticides and you had these very natural organic soils and you poured a little bit of um, fertilizer on it and boof everything rocketed and everything grew like mad so farmers bought into it they were like wow well, i can grow twice as much whatever on my farm by buying this stuff but what that's done over 70 years is it's degraded soils it's basically killed off the natural biology and it's replaced it with an artificial chemistry so soils have kind of turned into a, a drug addict they don't function you've got to think a lot of these modern grains and 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 crop varieties farmers are buying are developed in labs in sterile soil so they don't really perform or germinate properly without these artificial inputs um and you know this is probably less of an issue here as it is in other countries that are, you know, like America, that are a bit more kind of, you know, cowboy with what they're doing and or what they have done anyway. But so basically, if you just overnight went organic and regenerative, your soil was going to have, whoa, what's going on? Like me and this soil and this grain can't handle that. We, we're dependent on these you know the, these these phosphates and and artificial nitrates that are being applied multiple times in the in the growing season as well as the herbicides and pesticides and everything else so it's very much like well how do we wean soils off of that and what you'll find is if you want to turn organic or regenerative then you will for the first few years see difficulties weeds will come through because they're trying to fill those gaps of bare soil etc that would have initially been nuclear bombed by pesticides so you know it's not like you can all of a sudden overnight turn your farm from a conventional farm to a thriving ecosystem it, it does take time but you know i think the 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 best thing with this is once you make that commitment and you stick with it i haven't heard of a single farmer whether they're you know on ten thousand acres of arable land or relatively small like us that have made that transition they've never gone back where they were but they always have the neighbor looking over the fence going oh i wonder what they're doing that looks really great but um or the, you know they must be weirdos you know they're not doing what everyone else is doing but luckily more and more farmers are kind of getting interested in the idea i think that's the, the first step and in terms of costings you know the whole point of regenerative agriculture it's reducing inputs and once your soil start functioning properly and you're, you know, whether you're doing multi-diverse cover crops and or planting multiple cash crops at the same time um, and attracting or insects and everything else, anyway, sorry. You're, you're out. Ah, sorry, I muted you, Silas. Sorry. Sorry. So basically over time, your output should increase as your soils become more function more naturally and your inputs are decreasing so your costs go down your output goes up and you know if you there's lots of examples of people that have been doing this for 20 years or more and um you know and you see what they've achieved in a relatively short time both in terms of soil health and you know biodiversity but also their kind of financial um records as well because it's quite kind of overwhelming really yeah i mean i was surprised as i talked uh, given uh, by Reading University, and uh, was actually, I think, vice president of the NFU, 
has done that. He's turned his farm over and he's done away with the arable side and he's sold all his equipment and is basically going over to uh, starting to follow the path that you obviously have trodden already. Um, there's some, there's a, someone's made a point about uh, methane. Uh, uh, methane is a big problem with livestock. Does this form of farming make a difference? So methane gets a very unduly bad rap. So me, if you have you know, the same unit measure of methane and the same unit measure of carbon dioxide, the immediate warming effect from methane is greater. Um, what they don't go into is that the, the time it takes for methane to break down, so methane, methane is basically carbon and hydrogen, you know, carbon and water, is about a 12-year cycle. So for me, methane and 10 to 12 years, so say methane emitted 10 years ago is coming back down onto our planet's surface as rain, and into soils as, as, as carbon through photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide, which has less of a heating effect compared to the same unit of methane, that has a 1000 year cycle till that breaks down into carbon and oxygen. So if you think humans started seriously pumping carbon dioxide into our atmosphere with the industrial revolution, you know, we discovered fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas, that's all, that's all carbon or carbon emissions that was locked underground, you know, not in our atmosphere. And over the last 250 years, that has been introduced into our atmosphere. And that's going to take another 800 years from the stuff that was admitted in the Victorian times to break down into carbon and oxygen and come back down again. Whereas, you know, methane emitted by my cow burps 10 years ago that's already come back down and that's part of that carbon cycle so the difference with our system because they're outside on pasture all year round you know cow burps makes methane goes up into the atmosphere methane that's already in the atmosphere comes down is absorbed by plants through photosynthesis goes into plant root systems is exuded as a, as a sugary carbon exudate, which feeds soil biology. And there's a kind of carbon economics going on in the soil. You know, soil microbiology feeds the plant with the nutrients it needs in exchange for this carbon sugary substance that the root em emits off. And then the plant grows, that plant is made of carbon. The cow comes along, eats that plant, turns some of it into milk, turns some of it into meat, and they belch out a small minority, and then it goes round in a circle. So if you think, for example, in America, in, you know, current, currently in America, there's about half as many domesticated cattle as there were wild bison pre-European settlement. And if you look at what America looked like pre-European settlement, you know, there's accounts of those arid states like New Mexico and Southern Texas that are now essentially just desert. They, you know, they had grass so tall they could pick it up and tighten a knot over the horse of their saddle and there were more bison and elk and things and people could count and you know the soils were six foot deep and jet black that is carbon storage probably the single biggest way to store carbon on this planet is in our soils and that's being degraded over time basically by plowing human management you know, leaving soils fallow, not having a living root in those soils. It rains, it washes off. That's why all our rivers go brown when it rains. You would have seen the Thames and Henley when we get flooded. It's, it's brown, it's not clear. You know, that's taking that carbon and that soil nutrient and everything else and those pesticides and nitrates and it's causing algal blooms. It kills all the aquatic life. Um, and, you know, I've kind of gone off track a bit, but yeah, when it comes to methane, it's it's really not bad. If you have cows in, in feedlots and they're just there and they're not part of the carbon cycle, then yeah, they're contributing methane to the atmosphere. But if they're on pasture and properly managed pasture, they're part of a carbon cycle. So that methane is constantly being recycled. Compare that to the travel industry or the manufacturing industry, they're burning fossil fuels and they're sending carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And that's going to take a thousand years for that to come back down. So, um, yeah, if you ask me about methane and carbon, I think it's more of a the big guys of all the money pointing the finger at the small guys with the cows that don't have the economic clout to bite back, really. <laughs> There's another 
point here, uh, there's a, there's a uh, Jackie has uh, uh, shout out the fungi. And of course, a lot of the carbon that's in the soil is actually in the soil as fungi. And that's what modern agriculture destroys with the uh, pesticides, herbicides, and with nitrates and phosphates. So I think uh, that is probably uh, as important uh, for, for soil quality is having a, a soil which will support a massive fungi, a fungal population underneath as well. Definitely. So what excites a lot of regenerative agricultural farmers, I think they're like the most is, is mycorrhizal fungi. And that's these underground networks in the soil of, of different types of, of mycorrhizae or, or fungi. And, you know, these mycorrhizal or fungi, they kind of, they create this kind of underground network, like a spider's web, or like the internet, and it can spread for miles, tens of miles, they're all interconnected, and they can transfer nutrients through the soil to where it's needed to certain plants. Um, and, you know, they'll, they'll stick around the root surface of plants, and it can increase the root surface area by 1000 times if you have a healthy mycorrhizal fungi population. And as soon as you send a plow through a field, you kill that off. As soon as you put a fungicide on that field, you kill it off. As soon as you put artificial fertilizers and phosphates into that soil, you start killing all of that off. And that's why, you know, you look at forests, for example, woodland, the soil is jet black. It's full of carbon. It's full of mushrooms and fungi. It hasn't been tampered with by humans, really. And the best thing that we can do as farmers is, is, is just feed that. That's what we're doing in regenerative agriculture. We're, we're trampling grass, we're trampling crop residues with cattle into the soil. We're injecting that carbon in. We're not using fungicides. We're trying to, you know, improve that whole microbiology and, and, and mycorrhizal fungi is an integral part of that, which is really interesting stuff, but quite nerdy, yeah. Yeah. This, a different topic. Uh, do you show your cattle? No, I, I don't. Um, it's kind of a different game, really. There's a lot of, you know. I, said, I mean, one of the ones you had, the one with the horns that came down, very pretty looking cow. I mean, would that win a prize, do you think? I think our cattle would do well. Um, you know, we had the Longhorn Cattle Society here a couple of summers ago for their annual summer visit. And predominantly everyone that came out of the 80 or so people that did were, you know, cattle showers they produce cows to rear them to show them at shows to sell them for a high price as pedigree breeding stock and they're all conventional they're all using kind of concentrates and grains to get cattle as big and fat as possible so they look as big and fat at the shows so you know got the best cow supposedly but um you know i, I did feel a bit smug so i think a lot of them came here with this idea of organics that the farm was going to be covered in weeds and the cattle were going to be skinny and unhealthy and um yeah, they took them a while to believe me that we're not using pesticides, um, you know, herbicides and our, our weed killer, essentially, or, you know, we're not feeding grains. And when you seriously think about soil and pasture and biodiversity, everything else fits. And I would feel more than confident showing some of my cows around a show ring. But the um, problem is none of them have been on a halter with the with the ropes. So um, <laughs> they react very well. But you know, our cows look as good as, as anyone else's. Um, if not, I think they're pretty much always on the fat side, really. But, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not my specialty, but it's, yeah. Okay, great. And the, it's in the news. The government has given in to the GM regulation. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're going to start doing gene editing. Is that, do you think that can have a positive or a negative impact on you and your business? If you asked me six years ago, I wrote a, a, a paper at the RAU. Um, I think it was the, it's to do with the future of agriculture and what the kind of key components of agriculture are going to be in order to feed the planet by 2050 or 9 billion people, wherever they're supposed to be. And one of the things that I wrote about in that as a positive thing was, was genetically modifying crops so they could perform better in in poor environments such as Africa, you know, drought tolerance, things like that. Um, if you ask me now, I'd say no. You know, there's lots and lots of farmers in, in very hot, brittle countries, Mexico, Africa, 
South America, Southern States America that are turning their whole farms around through regenerative agriculture and properly managed livestock. You know, one of the kind of, if you like the word poster boys of, of all of this is Alan Savory. And he did that quite famous TED talk about properly managed livestock. And he's based in Zimbabwe. He started off as an ecologist. Um, he always thought that, you know, livestock were the problem about why Africa is degrading and desertifying. So desertifying going from green, luscious, productive pastures into desert, basically. Um, and he, he developed this thing called um, holistic management um, framework. And he's implemented that on farms all over the world. And he's turned basically starving communities in Africa into communities that are not only self-sufficient, they're growing enough food to then sell at a market. So they are making money and they're creating an economy. And that is just through adopting regeneratively, regenerative agricultural practices and properly managed livestock. So they're, they're turning desert into productive soil again. Um, and that's something that's happened all in pretty much every continent on this planet, probably other than like Antarctica. So again, you talk about genetically modified products, that's something that's very easy to monetize. Monsanto, which is probably the biggest agribusiness company in the world, they're the ones that are pushing this agenda. The, the CEO of Monsanto has just been made the head advisor to the USDA to Joe Biden. So he's the head honcho in agriculture in America, and he's also the CEO of Monsanto, which is a bit crazy. But, you know, they're selling genetically modified cotton seeds, for example, to farmers in India that, um, you know, they're meant to be more drought, drought tolerant which is great, but they put a suicide gene in them. So farmers can't harvest the seeds off the cotton and replant them next year. They have to go back to Monsanto to buy new ones. So, you know, again, as far as I'm concerned, this is a problem that is there, but it can be solved from what I've seen and read by just proper regenerative management and treating your soil and your farm as an ecosystem. And as soon as you start talking about genetically modified stuff, it has potential risks for ecosystem collapse. What happens when those genetically modified genes translocate into, you know, um, other plants that it wasn't intended to, then all of a sudden you get weeds that can't be eradicated. Um, and, you know, if companies like Monsanto are going to put suicide genes in them, so you have to keep coming back to them to buy it, then, um, you know, it's pretty obvious what's going on there in terms of the, the financial benefit to a few big yeah. companies really well I, th I think we've come to the end of the questions silas right so i think uh, unless anyone else wants to um to to ask a question it really down to is it there's a few people have put out vote of thanks it's been a really brilliant talk thank you silas and thank you for for, for doing this uh I will, uh, we will edit the recording and we'll send a copy to you. So that's for you to do what you will. And if anyone knows of anyone else that wants to, 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 to listen to this talk or might want to listen to this talk, please just email Karina Henley and we'll make sure that they get a copy as well so that we can spread the word. Uh, it really is down to me now to thank you. Uh, and if everyone wants to uh, turn on their uh, their uh, cameras uh, really uh, uh, applause for yeah really well done thank you very much indeed yeah thanks well if anyone's got any you know questions later on just, just drop me an email I'll, I'll look at it at some point brilliant when you now you've got all this time now you've got a butcher on site <laughs> well, I think I've got the same amount of time it'd just be filled with different things but yeah Thanks again. That's been really brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.